Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Carl, and thank you, worship team. I was going to say you guys can go ahead and be seated, but we already are. Hey, listen, do me a favor real quickly, and uh, man, just turn to somebody around you, and then just tell them, say, it's good to see you. Good to see you. We love seeing you. You look beautiful today. Great mustache. Except don't say that to a woman, because then things get kind of weird. Awesome. So, um... Uh, one of the favorite games that Alyssa and I love to play is we love playing the game Sequence. I don't know if anybody here has ever played this game before. And so I am not a board game guy. Uh, I didn't grow up playing board games. Uh, but man, but when I got married, uh, I became a board game guy. And so uh, Sequence is a game that, interestingly enough, when I was a youth pastor, uh, me and the youth team, we went away on a retreat, and this game was just sitting on the shelf. And I was like, let's play that. And then we played it. And then after that, we got hooked on it. And then my wife and I became really good at it, and we'll play you in it if you guys think that you're good. But anyway, um, so the way that you played, if, you don't, if you've never played this game before, the way that you play is that every team has a different colored chip. You know, you're blue, you're green, you're red. And so um, the goal of the game is for you to get a sequence, whether that's five sequences, two sequences, three sequences, whatever it is that you guys set up. But the way that you get a sequence is that you have to get four or you have to get five chips in a row. And then so you have your hand, and after that you keep laying down cards. You can work as a team, you can work individually, but the goal of the game is that you have to get five in a row, and then that's a sequence. And so you can do that diagonally, you can do that horizontally, you can do that vertically, but the goal of the game is that you got to connect five of them together. And so, um, you know, Alyssa and I, we, we, uh, we, we play very often, and um, sometimes we keep playing long into the night because if I keep beating my wife, then she won't let me sleep until I, until she, I lose. And then so finally I just throw the game and I lose. So um, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Um, but what happens though is that sometimes, you know, as we're playing this game, as we're playing this game, sometimes I'll look at it and I'm like, man, I don't know what to do next. You know, because you go around, you wait your turn. And usually by the time it's my turn, like I know where I'm going next because I've had all that time to think. And so sometimes, though, when I play, I get stuck. Like, I'm looking at it, and I just, like, don't know where to go. And so during those moments when I get stuck, what I like to do is I like to get up, and then after that, I look to just move around and just look at things. Because what happens is that, you know, not all the time, but sometimes as I'm looking at things this way, I feel like I'm stuck and I don't see anything else. But every now and then, if I just like move, I just get up and shift my perspective, I see things a lot differently. And sometimes when I shift my perspective, I see that, oh, the other team, they're about to get a sequence, so I better block them. And so it tells me, my perspective tells me that I got to be on the defensive. And then sometimes when I, when I shift my view another way, I'll look at the board and I'll be like, dude, I'm so close to getting a sequence. I have the cards. I didn't realize it. And then that tells me, then my perspective then tells me that I got to go offensive and that's the way I need to act. And so the crazy thing about this game is that it doesn't matter where you, it doesn't, doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what happens. What happens is, is that because I shifted my perspective, I saw things a lot differently. Nothing on the board changed, right? It's not like when I got up and then walked this way, you know, she changed this or we moved that on. None of it has changed. The only thing that's changed is my perspective on it has changed, and therefore it allows me to do something that I need to do. And see, folks, that's the power of perspective. The power of perspective isn't that it necessarily changes things. The power of perspective is that it changes the way that you view them so you have a true understanding of what's really going on. Amen? The power of perspective is that it change, doesn't change things. It just changes the way that you view them to see what's really going on. It's the reason why that there are some of us here that we can look at the same thing and have two totally different views. I promise you that if we get you know, five of us together and we say, well, tell me what you think about this issue, it'll be the same issue, but we'll have five different views. Why? Because we'll have five different perspectives. It's the reason why there are so many of you that, that you're friends with a guy and he's driven and it looks like he's successful. It looks like he has everything put together. And from the outside, look at him. That's our perspective of him. But if you look at things from his perspective, he's insecure and he doesn't know where his worth. Nobody's ever validated him. And so deep inside, he feels this emptiness. See, we see him as full, but he sees himself as empty and that's what drives him 
Same thing we're seeing, just two totally different perspectives. It's the reason why there are some of us here that, that, that man, that whether this is you, and, and hopefully it's not, and if, man, if it is you, hopefully the Lord will change your perspective. But some of you may, may know people like this, but that's the reason why some of us can look at a, a beautiful young lady who loves the Lord with all of her heart, and we can say, man, she has it put together. She's awesome. Man, she's going to do great things for the Lord. She's beautiful inside and out. But yet that's also the same lady that when she looks at herself, she doesn't see anybody who's worth it. She doesn't see somebody who's valuable. She sees somebody who's ugly and who's fat, and that's why she struggles with either bulimia or anorexic, you know, or anorexia. And, and, and two totally different perspectives, but the same person. So it's not that the things have changed, it's just that our perspective of them have changed. And so these next few weeks, we're going to be talking about perspective. Because what a perspective is, a perspective is getting a true understanding of something. And so these next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the topics like, you know, how, how's your perspective on yourself? Does, does the way that you view yourself line up with the truth of Scripture? Does it line up with the way that God views you? You know, we're going to be talking about a perspective of thankfulness, because how many guys realize that thankfulness really is a matter of perspective, amen? That you can have one guy here who's totally rich, and he can say, I have nothing to be thankful for, and you can have a guy who's all the way over here who has nothing, but he'll be thankful for the meal that he gets in front of him. Thankfulness is just a matter of perspective. And then the last thing that we'll talk about a couple weeks from now is probably one of the most important perspectives we'll have, and we're going to be talking about our perspective of God. How do we view our Heavenly Father? Do we view God as a reflection of our Father? Do we view God as a reflection of our bosses, of our our coaches, of our earthly fathers, or do we view God as the perfection of all of them? And so this morning what we're going to be doing this is we're going to be talking about the perspective that we should have on our circumstances, a perspective on our circumstances. So if you guys have been watching the news uh, lately or you guys have been, you know, aware of what's going on, I think everybody here is aware that this past week, has been one of the most defining weeks for our nation. It's been one of the most defining weeks. Uh, some people are, are awesome. You know, they love it. They love what's going on. Some people are just worried about it. So, so what's happened is, is that for those of you guys who don't know, you know, um, what's happened is that this past week, obviously, we had the election. We're voting. Nothing is set in stone yet. But according to the people taking the polls and the people who are measuring the results, and it looks like that to Joe Biden is going to be the president-elect of the United States of America. He's going to be the 46th president of the United States. And so what's happening is, is that because of what's going on, there are lots of people who have different perspectives on what's happening. See, there are some of us here that, that, that you look at that, you're like, this is awesome, I love it, that man, that now is the time for change, that we're going to be the most successful nation in the, in, the, in the world, that man, I love what Joe Biden brings, it's going to be great. And then there are some of us who are looking at it, and man, we are the complete other side. That we're looking at it and we're like, oh, we were so worried, that we're stressed out, that we feel anxious about it, that we don't know what's going to happen with the economy. We don't know what's going to happen with, you know, his ruling on different things. We just don't know. So same thing, what's happening, right? It's just two totally different perspectives that we have on that. And so what I want to do today is, is again, I want to talk about the power of perspective and I want to talk about the proper perspective that we should have on our circumstances. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing is that we all have three things when it comes to, we all have three things in common when it comes to perspective, okay? We all have three things in common. Number one is this, is that we all have a perspective. We all have a better for worse, whether it's true or not, we all have a perspective, we all have an opinion. The second thing that we all have in common is that we all think that our perspective is the right perspective, right? <laughs> like, man, if they would just listen to me. All right, now listen, don't be nudging your neighbor now, especially if it's your spouse, okay? We, we all, like, when it comes to our family, we all have different families, but the one thing we all have in common when it comes to our families is we all think, if only my family would listen to me, gosh, it would be so much better. If only my parents would listen to me, if only my brother would listen to me, I just know what's going on. So we all think our perspective is the right perspective. But the third thing that we all have in common is that we all need Jesus' perspective to determine our perspective. That's what we all have in common. Because see, at the end of the day, we only have opinions. Because Jesus said, what did Jesus say about himself? Jesus said, I am the way, the the truth, and the life. And so listen, Jesus is the truth. So listen, people can have opinions about you, but that's all they are. The only one who has truth about you is Jesus. 
And so we can have opinions about what's going on in our society today, but the only one who has a truth about how we should be viewing it is Jesus. So we need him. We need his word to inform our perspective on things. So listen, this is what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to go over a, uh, an account found in Numbers chapter 13, and it's going to be talking about the nation of Israel. And what we're going to see here is that the nation of Israel, they are about to take over their promised land. But what happens is, is that as they encounter opposition, as they encounter their circumstances, we start to see how their perspective of them actually determines their destiny. How the perspective of them actually determines their destiny. So Numbers chapter 13, and we're going to start here at verse 27. Numbers chapter 13, we'll start at verse 27. And then after that, we will, yeah, we'll go from there. So, uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse 27, here. Uh, this is what it says. says, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. So basically what's happening here is that the, you know, Moses, is that the spies, so before the Israelites enter into the promised land, Moses sends out the spies. He says, listen, you go check it out. And so the spies, they, they come back 40 days later and they say, Moses, man, the land that you send us, it is it's, it's good. Somebody say, it's good. it's good. It's good. I mean, like, listen, say it with some, ugh, some attitude. Say, it's good. It's good. It's good. They come, the, the spies came back and they said, listen, it's good. And so they said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. What they're basically saying is that it is a land, man, that is fertile. It's a land that has lots of wells and waters. It's a land that's going to be great for our agriculture. It's, gonna, it's a land that's going to be great for our livestock. It is good. How many of you guys here realize this morning that God has something that is good for you? Amen? God has a promised land for every single one of us. God has a purpose for us. His word says that. In fact, I love that everybody knows this verse, but Jeremiah 29, 11 says that, man, that I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Listen, he says that to you. And then after that, in Romans 12, 2, it says this. It says that, man, that we may be able to test and approve what God's will is for us. And listen, this is what it says about God's will. God's will for us is, he uses three words, is good and it's pleasing, and it's perfect. Oh, how many of you guys, are, that sounds good, doesn't it? God's will for you is good and pleasing and perfect. So we have a promise that we have something that is good for us. God wants to give us good. God wants to give us that. God wants to give you that. In fact, let me say this, is that there are some of you here right now that, man, that you need to renew your perspective of yourself and the way that God views you. Because some of you right now, you don't even believe that. Some of you right now don't believe that, that God wants good for you. And I'm here to tell you this morning, your heavenly father wants good for you. He wants what's pleasing for you. And then what he wants for you is perfect. And you got to believe that. So there's the land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. And the verse 28 here says this, but the people living there, this is the spies, they're reporting all this to Moses. They said, but the people living there, man, they're powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants of the descendants of the Anak. Verse 29, the Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites, Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites, they live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along all the Jordan Valley. So what's happening now is that the Israelites are saying, listen, we know, Moses, <laughs> that this is the land you have for us. But man, it's full of people. I mean, and they are strong. And not only are they strong, but man, but they are everywhere. They're so spread out there everywhere. We can't go anywhere without, without them knowing that we're here, Moses. And so their perspective of it was like, wow, they are everywhere. There's nothing that we can do about it. But in my study of this verse, it's, it's, it's really interesting. One of the commentators, one of the commentaries that I read said, Israel, they view this as a bad thing that the Canaanites and Jebusites and over, they were all over the place. But they said, actually, if you would look at it from like a military standpoint, they said, actually, this is a great thing that they were all spread out. He said, because the Israelites, what they can do is they can attack one town and they don't have to fear the consequence of another town coming to their aid right away because they're so spread out. So they could actually do a, 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 a crusade or a canvas of it where they can go after one and then another one and then another one, and by the time they realize what's going on, it's too late because they're so spread out. There's no centralized location for them to be able to help each other. So that was a good thing that they were spread out. But see, it's, 
It's all a matter of perspective in the way that you viewed it. And the Israelites, when they viewed it, they saw it as a bad thing. So continuing on here in verse 30, it says this, but then Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer it. By the way, did you guys know that Caleb, when they were about to, when at this point, they were about 40 years old, but then when he actually came back and conquered the promised land, he was about 80 years old when he started the conquest. See, it doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old. God has a promised land for you. So he said this, we can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. They said, no, we can't go up against them. They're too big. They look like Jerry, they look like Jerry Snyder. I mean, they're just too big. They're, shout out to you, bro. Uh, they are stronger than we are. So they spread out this bad report about the land among the Israelites. And then they said this, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. And see, what this verse means, again, you know, when I was studying this verse, some theologians say that as the spies were sent out all over the land, the spies actually ran into heaps of corpses being burned because at the time of exploration, that there was a disease, there was a plague rav uh, ravaging the land, that people were getting sick and people were dying. And then so what the other people of the nations they had to do was they had to take the, the people out. They had to take these dead corpses out, and then they had to burn them. And so when the Israelites saw that, they said, oh, my gosh. This land, man, there's sickness, there's plagues, man, man, this land will devour anyone who comes in there. We can't go in there, Moses. But see, that's one perspective. The other perspective that you could have had is, God sent this plague ahead of us. God is fighting for us. God is already weakening the enemy. Oh, man, man, they're sick. They're not going to be able to stand against us, Moses. We got this. See? Same circumstance, just two totally different perspectives on what's happening with that circumstance. And then what happens is this, is that then going on, it says all the people we saw there were giants, the descendants of the Enoch next to them. We felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. See, what happens is, is that, wait, let's go back real quick. Who felt like we were grasshoppers? We did. So what happens is, is that your perspective on the outside always eventually affects your perspective on the inside. And so their perspective of them eventually affected their perspective of themselves. And then verse 1, what happens is then, this is this, that then all night, the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. And if you guys know what happens then in the rest of the story, what happens is, is that because of their lack of faith or because of their wrong perspective, God says, listen, all right, listen, you don't want to go in, fine. And what happens is, is that he said he makes the Israelites wander the desert for 40 more years until an entire generation, until everyone who at that time was old enough to fight dies off in the desert, and then the nation of Israel then comes in, and then after a whole generation, and then, then they're able to take the promised land. You see, what happened is, is that because of an incorrect perspective, right? See, see, the plan was is that God wanted to give them, right? Like if I looked at you guys today and I said, listen, like God wants to give you all this. God wants to give you the fullness. That's why, you know, God wants to give you the fullness. That's why God said in John 10, 10, I have come that they may experience life and they, they, they may have life to the full, right? Jesus wants us to experience life to the full, but that also means that we can, always, we can also experience life that's half. And when Jesus, when God spoke to the nation of Israel, he wanted to give them life to the full. He wanted them to experience the fullness of their destiny. But because of their incorrect perspective, they were only able to experience half full. Because of their incorrect perspective, they, were, they, they didn't experience the blessing right away. They experienced delayed blessing. <laughs> so church, what, what do we want today? Do we want the fullness of what God has for us? Do we want the fullness of what God has for our marriage? Do we want the fullness of what God has for our family? Do we want the fullness of what God has for us? Do we want blessing right away? Do we want what God has for us right away in his time? Or do we want half full? Do we want delayed? Because see, here's the thing, is that your perspective will eventually determine your destiny. Your perspective will eventually determine your destiny. So uh, what do we do? So what do we do, right? 
So what I want to do is I want to go over three questions to ask yourselves to make sure that our perspective on our circumstances lines up with Jesus' perspective on our circumstances. So we want to make sure that our perspective on what's going on around us lines up with what God, the way that God views it. So we're going to look at three questions to ask yourself in order to make sure that our perspective lines up with his. Amen? You guys with me? You guys good? All right. So question number one to ask yourself is this. Question number one is this. Is what's your anchor? What's your anchor? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I bring these analogies back all the time, and I apologize for that, but it's just so cool the way that God works um, with different sports analogies. But, you know, when, I remember when uh, I used to play football. I started playing football when I was in seventh grade, and then I remember when, when I played football in seventh grade, I was just like little tiny, like, run. I was like this little tiny dude. And what happened is, though, is that we had a junior varsity team, we had a varsity team. And then our varsity guys, for some reason, they got injured, they were out, and so they looked at this little tiny seventh grader and they said, Nate, you can hike the ball really good, you're a good long snapper. They said, we need you in that game to snap the ball. And I said, me? <laughs> like, my voice is still, me? And then I remember the coach saying, yes, like, we need you on that line. And I was like, okay. And so I remember, like, the first time I was in there, I was, I was in there to snap the ball. And I remember I got down in the football, and I, I was down like this. And I remember looking up in front of me, and, like, the other varsity dude on the other team looking up at me, like, dude, he looked like he had been taking growth hormones. Like, he had, it was crazy. And I remember him looking at me and going, fresh meat, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And then I remember what I did was I looked over, and then I looked over to my right, the guard next to me, his name was David Salinas, and homeboy was huge. I mean, this boy loved to eat, kind of like your boy here. So he loved to eat. So I remember he was big, and then I looked at over at David, and I was like, David, you, you got this? And then David looked at me, and he goes, yeah, man, don't worry about it. I got you. And I was like, okay. And then I remember, like, that game, I was so scared because of, like, the dude that was in front of me. But here's the crazy thing, though, is I remember I was scared but that whole game, I don't ever remember anybody from the other team touching me. Because my dude, David, was my anchor. Like, he had my back. And he just kept plowing, he kept moving, and he kept pulling, he kept doing this, and he kept crossing with me, and it was good, man. Like, nobody ever touched me that game. Why? Because David was the one who I had faith in during that game. Psalms 18 says this, it says, I love you, Lord, for you are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior, my God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and he is my place of safety. Church, can I ask this this morning? What's your anchor? What's your anchor? Is our anchor, is our anchor in who got elected as president or who didn't get elected as president? Is our anchor our, our job? Is our anchor our employer? Is our anchor what's in our bank account? Is our anchor how many people follow us on, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook? Is our anchor on how we look, how we dress, on how we look physically? What's our anchor? Because, see, the reason why there are a lot of us getting all whacked out today is because, listen, let's face into it, and I'm going to tell you some truth real quickly. The reason why a lot of us are getting whacked out is because the dude that we did, whatever, he didn't get it, and so he was our anchor. Can I tell you this morning, listen, Biden isn't your, and if you're happy, that's awesome, that, but, you gotta, you know, but listen, Biden isn't your anchor. Trump isn't your anchor. None of them are our anchor. Jesus is our anchor. Come on, somebody. Who does the Bible say is the one seated on the throne in heaven, and it says that the earth is his footstool? It's not Trump. It's not Biden. It's not your bank account. It's Jesus. It's God the Father. And listen, if God's seated on the throne, then we're okay. If God's seated on the throne, we're all good. Amen? But you've got to decide who's your anchor. 
Because see, the Israelites, they went into it, and all of a sudden, they started seeing this, they started seeing that, and all of a sudden, they lost, oh my gosh, they lost track of the one who fought for them. They lost track of the one who went before them. They lost track of the one who parted the Red Sea. They lost track of the one, man, who did all those plagues in Egypt. They, were, they, they, were, they lost sight of the one who led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I mean, listen, somebody, that's the God that we serve. That's the God who says, listen, be strong and be courageous. You know, when Joshua 1, 9, where it says, be strong and be courageous, it literally means, when you look at the way you translate that verse, it literally means, anchor yourself to me, Joshua. Anchor yourself to me. So church, let's be a people who anchors ourselves to Jesus. If you're feeling whacked out, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling worried, I want to ask you, question yourself. Where does your anchor hold? What's your anchor? All right. Question number two is this. Question number two is simply this, what's the word? So what's your anchor? Question number two is what's the word? Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, one thing, my father-in-law and I, who's the, single, the lead pastor here in this place, um, I love him and we are so different in many ways. But one of the things that we were both similar in uh, was the way that we like to drive. And um, one time when I, was, uh, when I was a youth pastor in Missouri, uh, Alyssa came out to visit me, and I remember that she said, oh my gosh, Nate, my, my flight's going to be late. We got to go. And she was flying out of St. Louis, and I was like, I got this. No worries. So I was flying down Interstate 70 to St. Louis from Columbia, Missouri, and then the whole time, the speed limit that I saw was like was 70, 70, 70, 70. So then that means I can go 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. And then so I'm like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm just going to keep going. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, it's like when you feel like the Lord speaks to you. All of a sudden, I had that feeling because I looked behind me, and then I see those bright lights flashing. Bloop, bloop. And I was like, what's wrong? Dang it. And so I pulled over. And then after that, the, the state trooper gets out. And man, looking all tough and just, like, intimidating, he looks at me and goes, you know what the speed limit is? And I was like, uh, 70? And he goes, nope. You were going 80 and a 60. And I said, I was? And they looked at me and said, why were you driving so fast, sir? And I was like, well, listen, man, just, just, you know, I was coming from Columbia and all these sides to 70, 70, 70. So my mentality was, it was, and then he interrupted me. He said, so you're speeding because it's a mentality that you have? You have a mentality to speed? And I was like, no, sir, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I was like, I just thought it was. He said, well, it doesn't matter what you thought. It matters what's written on that sign. And I was like, okay and then you know i got a ticket and all that stuff and but but it was interesting what he said he said this he said listen he said it doesn't matter what you think it matters what's written on that sign doesn't matter what you think doesn't matter what you feel what's what's written what's written so what I want to ask is this, the second question to this, guys, is, is man, what, what does the word say? See, Matthew 24, 35 says this. It says that heaven and earth, come on, somebody, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall still remain. What does that mean? It means that eventually everything we put our hope and our trust in, the laws, the amendments, everything, heaven and earth will pass away. But unless it's his words, it will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. So, so let me ask a couple of questions real quickly about the word, okay? About the word. Doesn't the word say in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, it says this, I urge you to pray and to intercede and to make thanksgiving for all people, for kings and for all those who are in the high positions. Doesn't his word say that we need to pray for our leaders regardless of who's in office? Doesn't his word say in Romans 13, 1, that there is no authority except from God, and all authorities that are there have been instituted by God. So that means it doesn't matter if he's there, they're there, they're there, or whatever else. It means that they were placed there because God placed them there. And listen, church, we've got to, we've got to make this distinction real quickly. There is a difference between godly authority and God-placed authority, okay? So I'm not saying that just because they're in authority, they're going to be godly. I'm just saying that they're in authority, and listen, God's the one who placed them there. Philippians 4, 6 says, this doesn't Philippians 4 6 say this do not be anxious about anything but in everything in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God doesn't Jeremiah 29 11 again says that man I know the plans that I have for you plans to harm plans not to harm you but plans to prosper you doesn't Romans 12 2 says that my will for you is good and is pleasing and is perfect doesn't listen doesn't 2 Timothy 1 7 says this that God has not given us a spirit of fear or of timidity 
but of power and the love and of sound mind. Doesn't Proverbs 28 1 says this, that the right, listen, catch this, this is one of my favorite verses. Proverbs 28 1 says that the righteous are as bold as lions, but the wicked flee when no one is pursuing them. Man, listen, Isaiah 66 1 says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Listen, it doesn't matter what we feel, what mad, it doesn't matter what we think, what matters is what's written, what's written. And isn't it written that at the end of the day, at the end of the age, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. At the end of the day, doesn't it say that we win? Yes. That's the word. So let me ask us, are we aligning the way that we see things with the way that we feel? Are we aligning the way that we see things with the way that we think? Are we aligning the way that we see things with the way that society or culture or CNN says we should see them or Fox News says that we should see them? Or are we aligning ourselves with the truth of the word of God? Are we anchoring ourselves to that? But see, listen, church, this is what that means, though. That means that we've actually got to get into the word. <laughs> that means that you can't just rely on the preacher up here to give us the word. Come on, somebody, if you're just relying on Sunday morning, if Sunday morning is the only time that you eat, then your spirit's going to be weak and fragile, and eventually it's going to die. But you need to feed yourselves, man. What's, what's the word that God put in your heart? You got to feed yourselves daily, every single day. Do you know the word? See, see, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you err because you don't know the power of God and you don't know the word. I don't want him to say that about me. So do we know the word? Do we know the one who is the word? What's the word say about all this? Because the word needs to be our perspective. And then after that, guys, the last question I want to ask us is this, is what's your move? What's your move? So, um, you know, going back to that analogy that I, that I, that I said earlier with, with me and David, you see, David, he was, he was going to play alongside of me. But that meant, though, that I had to keep playing alongside of him. That, that listen, that his job was to take care of me, but my job is I had to hike that football. I had a job to do still. And I think it's interesting that one of the names that the believers used to call the Holy Spirit is the, name, is the word paraclete. The word paraclete. And for those of you guys who don't know what that means, the word paraclete, um, when you look at the etymology or when you look at the origination of that word, the word paraclete signifies this. It means call to one side. So what does that mean? It means that the Holy Spirit is called to your side, that the Holy Spirit is called to be your helper and your comforter. But, but listen, if he's called to be by your side, if he's called to be your helper, that means he's got to help you because you're doing something. You're doing something. You're doing something. <laughs> uh, man, I, and some of you guys may take offense to this, but, but let me just throw it out there. I, I love it, but I don't like the mentality the way we've taken to it. But, but there's this hymn, you know, the old school hymn that we used to sing. And it's, old, it's, it's called I'll Fly Away, right? You all know that? I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. You got to do all that. You got to do the offbeat. And so, listen, I, I love it because, yes, it gives us hope. But man, but some of us, that's our mentality that we have when it comes to this, this, this culture today. We come to church, we leave, and we say, all right, God, you and me are good. And we sit down, we say, because someday I'll fly away. And that's the only thing we do is we just sit and we wait. Listen, God didn't call you to sit and wait. God called you to do. God called you to be. Uh, just because you're not doing anything bad doesn't mean you're doing something good. And last time I checked, God's called us to be agents of change. God's called us to be catalysts of change. God's called us a city on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. That's what God's called. He didn't call us to sit on our bottoms and just sing, you know, I'll fly away, oh, glory sometimes. No, no, no. God's called you to do something. Doesn't matter if you've, you know, accepted Christ five days ago. Doesn't matter if you accepted Christ five decades ago. Doesn't matter if you're young because David was young when he took on Goliath. Doesn't matter if you're old because Joshua and Caleb were 80 years old when they started the conquest of the promised land. If you're young, if you're old, if you're new, if you're not, listen, God has something for you to do. God has something for you to do. Did you know that, that statistics in the church world say today that 20% of the people do 80% of the work? What if we flip that around? 
Guys, listen, God's called you to do something. What's God called you to do? I don't know. If you're a grandparent, could it be that God has called you to reach out to your children, to reach out to your grandchildren? Because listen to me, grandparents, we need your voice today. We need mentors. We need leadership. We may not act like it because, trust me, sometimes we're hard-headed. But, man, listen, we need you. Parents, listen, we need you to keep modeling what it looks like to have a godly marriage because sometimes the best gift you could ever give to your kids is a model of what a godly marriage looks like. Man, listen, we need you to engage. We need you to do something. We need you to serve as an usher. We need you to serve as a greeter. We need you to serve here to serve there. We need your voice. We need you. And listen, I know that some of us may be thinking, well, why do you need me? Why does that matter? Because here's the thing is that by yourself, we may not be able to tip the scales, but one grain of rice, two grain of rice, three grain of rice, eventually all of us, we tip the scales. And that's the power of unity, and that's the power. Uh, man, one of the, one, one of the stories I'll remember forever is uh, I used to pastor at a church in Oklahoma, and there was this, 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 this girl, she came from a Muslim background, and she came again and again and again because her friends kept inviting her. And then one day, this girl who grew up as, as a Muslim, she gave her heart to the Lord, and I'm not going to say her name because she asked a long time ago that please don't ever mention my name because if people see my name, people hear me, then my family, it'll be bad. But she said she, she went to the pastoral staff and she told her testimony, and then we asked her, we said, what? What happened? Why did you accept the Lord? And then this is what she said. She said, she said, because pastor, from the moment I stepped foot in the parking lot to when I came in, to when I sat down, and then when I heard the word, she said, every single person I touched, I just felt love. She talked about the parking lot team. She talked about the greeters. She talked about the ushers. And then after that, she said, when I heard the word, when I heard the gospel, I needed to keep coming back. And finally, I said, God, if you are this loving, I need to give my life to you. See, by ourselves, we look like we don't make a difference. But she encountered love at every single point. And that's what we do when we serve, when we do something, is God uses us to tip the scales in his favor. We need you to do something. James 2, 17 says this. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Guys, let me tell you, time is too short. There's still people in your family who need Jesus. There's still people in Chambersburg who need Jesus. There's coworkers that need Jesus, people who go to your gym who need Jesus. Man, there are grandchildren, you know, wives, spouses. There are nephews and nieces. There's people in your schools. There are people who need Jesus. We need to do something about it. We need to do something. But this is where it starts, though. It starts first, though, with having the proper perspective and answering who is your anchor. So let me close with this, with this story that many of you guys know. But the story I want to close with is found in, in 2 Kings chapter 6. And at verse 14, and what's happening here in this story is that there's a prophet, there's a man of God whose name is Elisha. Everybody say Elisha. And this prophet is, is being used of God that there's this king of Aram. He wants to destroy the king of Israel. And then as he makes his plans, the Lord speaks to Elisha and says, Elisha, the king of Aram is going to be here. Elisha, the king of Aram is going to be there. And so every time the Lord speaks to Elisha, Elisha tells the king of Israel, and then he moves and he's safe. And then what happens, though, is that finally king of Aram says, enough, man, I am sick of this dude named Elisha. So he gathers his forces, and then he goes after Elisha. So it says this, so one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servants of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside the city, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. So let's do this real quickly. Yeah, this, actually, you four, right here, you four. Why don't you go ahead and come up? Yeah, Gardell looked at me like, what, me? Yeah, one, two, three, four, right there. Come on up. So you guys go ahead. Come right here. Surround me. One behind me, behind, you know, behind me, in front of me. There you go. Get behind me. There you go. So what happened? Come close. It's okay. It's all good. Listen, I don't have COVID. At least not no more. Here we go. Um, so, 
so listen, man, so, so this is what's happening is that the key or, or the servant of God went out and he looked around and he said, oh my gosh, I am surrounded. This is crazy. And he looked over at Elisha and said, Elisha, what should I do? And he started getting anxious and nervous and worried and depressed because it looked like things were about to end. And if we're being honest, this is where a lot of us feel like we're at right now. Oh my gosh, man, I can't believe that he just went, oh my gosh, man, I, uh, COVID, what's going on, my, my bank account, my employer, I don't, I don't know what to do, I don't know, this is worried, I'm, and we're so worried because we, we're looking around us at what we see, that this is our perspective of things, and we think, oh my gosh, God, what, what are we going to do? But what's really cool, though, is, is what happens, though, is this, you got to stay here, what happens, though, is this, it says here that Elisha looked at his servant, and he said this, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I see what you see. Don't be afraid. For there are more on our side than there are on theirs. Then Elisha prayed this. Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Then the Lord opens the man's eyes and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was full of horses and chariots of fire. So listen, this is what's happening. You, you three right here, you three, and then you guys, this row right here, come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up real quickly, come on, yeah, that's a, yeah. yes, Naomi, speaking to you too, come on, everybody, come on, get up, yeah, you guys, Griffin, come up here, let me call you by name, I mean, sorry, Braden, sorry, come up here, come up here, so listen, you guys surround the people who are surrounding me, you guys surround the people who are surrounding me, get around them, get around them, because somebody come right here behind this dude, you need to make sure you check this guy right here, there you go, come here, yeah, come right here, there you go, so what happened is though is that is that the man is that the servant of God looked around him and he saw the circumstances that were around him. But Elisha said, "Listen, don't worry." He said, "God opened his eyes, and when the Lord opened his eyes, what did he see? He saw chariots of fire on the hills surrounding them. What did he see? He saw the one who was surrounding the ones who were surrounding him." That though he may be, have been surrounded by the circumstances, by what's going around him, see, nothing's changed. They're still there, but all that's changed is his perspective on things. That now he didn't just see the people who were in front of him, but he saw the one who fought for him. He saw the one who surrounded the ones who were surrounding him. He saw that God is able, that God is willing, that God is powerful, that God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, God is omnipotent. That's what he saw. And so listen, he said, and I love that Psalm says this. Psalm says, listen, where does my help come from? My lift up your eyes to Zion. My help comes from the Lord. That that's where our perspective needs to be. Not on what's going on around us, but on who's the one who's got us. See, the difference was with David, the difference was is that when David faced Goliath, people just saw the giant. Dude, you're big. All right. David just saw the giant. But what did David see? David didn't see the giant. David saw the God behind the giant. And that's why he said, you come at me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he started going off. He was boasting in the Lord. Why? Because that's where his perspective was. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to ask you today, where's your anchor? What are you seeing? What is your circumstances telling you? But more importantly, what should you be telling your circumstances? Because you could be seeing this, but you could be telling, mm, no, I'm not, I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. Mm -mm. Because God's got me. Thanks, you guys. You guys can go and be seated. Appreciate your help. Mm -hmm. so, so this is what we're going to do. We're, we're, man, we're going to encourage ourselves. And I know that it's you know, a little bit over time, but listen, we're going to encourage ourselves today. And listen, you are going to speak, you are going to sing, because I feel like today that we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord and remind ourselves that, listen, He is our champion. He is our anchor. Amen? So we're going to go ahead into a time of worship, and we're going to sing the song, You Are My Champion. You Are My Champion. And there are some of us that were there. We get it. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Keep going. But there are some of you that you need to sing this and you need to declare this with faith to your worry, to your anxiety, to whatever is affecting you. You need to speak this over yourself that the Lord is our champion. Amen. So let's go and stand on up and we'll pray. And after that, we'll go into a short time of worship together. Then we'll, we'll close out from there. Father, thank you. That God, that you are our champion. 
Father, thank you, Jesus, that it doesn't matter what our circumstances say, Father, whether, you know, the dude got in that we wanted or whether not, it, it doesn't matter because, God, none of them are anchor, none of them are our hope. God, you are our hope. You are our champion. And so, Jesus, we just declare that today, God, that may we see things the way that you see them. Listen, with everybody's head bowed and everybody's eyes closed, I just want to throw this out there. It all starts, though, with you first receiving the one who is your anchor, with you receiving Jesus. Is there anybody here today who might say, Pastor Nate, I don't have Jesus in my heart. I don't have a relationship with him. But today I want to receive him. Listen, if that's you, just right where you're at, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Just raise your hand and I just want to pray with you. Everybody here say, that's me. Amen. Amen. See those hands? You guys can go and put them down. Listen, everybody pray this prayer with me. And if you raise your hand, let's mean this together. But everybody pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus... I open up my heart to you. I want you to be my hope, to be my anchor, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. I confess that Jesus died on the cross for me, for my sins. But I believe he rose on the third day And because he has new life, I can have a new life. I can have courage. Lord, seal yourself on my heart. And I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.